Now that we have explored how to measure and present results on a single quantity, measure on one entity in one place at one time, let's move on to the next kind of common task, which is to compare the uh, same quantity across multiple categories. In this section, we will largely focus on the simplest possible comparison, the comparison in between two categories. We may want to compare PFAL train lengths between northern and southern India, for example, or compare chick feeding behavior between male and female magpie robins, or compare species richness between highly polluted and less polluted wetlands. Depending on the situation and the study design, we measure multiple sampling units in each of these categories, and so we end up with two sets of numbers, one for each category. Typically, our purpose is to estimate how different the two underlying populations are from each other. Our best guess or estimate of this is the difference in the sample means, but we need to pay careful attention to the study design. We might have a study design that is matched or paired such that we measured, for example, the chick feeding rates of both individuals of a pair, male and female. Or we found pairs of wetlands near each other, one highly polluted and other not, and then the resultant data are also paired. In this case, the quantity of interest is the mean difference within each pair. And so we first take the difference within a pair and then we average across pairs. The unpaired study design is perhaps a more common situation to uh, be in. You run 40 transects in coffee plantations and 30 other transects in intact forest. And your purpose is to ask what is the difference in species richness between these two habitats. Or you follow 50 red vented bulbuls and note how they spend their time over 10 minutes and do the same for 80 red whiskered bulbuls. Your purpose being to ask what extent the two species differ in the time they spend in, let's say, aggressive behavior. Now, unlike uh, the situation in paired data, here there is no requirement that the sample sizes be the same, as there is no one-to-one -one relationship between any of the data in the first group and the data in the second group. Therefore, unlike the paired situation, we can't take differences within pairs and then average across pairs. Rather, we average across all data within each group and then examine the differences in the means of the two groups. Our goal is to calculate as best we can the true population difference in the means of the groups as estimated by the differences in the means of the samples we have collected from both these groups. So now we have our estimate of the population difference. How precise is this estimate? Answering this is pretty straightforward when your data are paired because you are dealing with just a single set of numbers the differences within each pair. And so you can treat those numbers just as you did when you were estimating a single quantity. And you can go ahead and calculate the precision of your estimate in the way we've discussed earlier. You can do the usual thing, find the confidence interval by bootstrapping the original sample, drawing many samples with the replacement and again and again, looking at the distribution of bootstrap means and finding the appropriate quantile, say, for a 95% confidence interval. Or we can take our familiar shortcut, calculating the standard error of our estimate and finding the 95% confidence interval by using the multiplier 1.96 plus minus uh, the mean. When the data are unpaired, things are a little different. Our measure of difference is the difference in the means of the two groups. We imagine this is one of many possible such differences that we could potentially have got. Um, using bootstrap, in each step you would resample A and separately resample B, calculate the means of each, subtract one mean from the other and store the difference of means. You would do this many times, perhaps a thousand times or ten thousand times, and then examine the distribution of the differences in the means. That was bootstrap. We may instead want to use the properties of the normal distribution to find the confidence interval. We would then need to calculate the standard deviation of the distribution of possible differences. In other words, we need to know the standard error of the differences. The complication here is that the standard error cannot just be the standard deviation by the square root of the sample size, because <clears throat> there are two uh, groups of data, each with their own standard deviation and their own sample size. So instead, we need to calculate a combined or a pooled standard error. Now, the details of how to calculate a pooled standard error are rather complicated and depending, depend on whether the population variances of group A and group B can be assumed to be identical or not. 
for both these cases, the separate formulas are on the slide and also the corresponding degrees of freedom, uh, which we know, of course, uh, we need in order to look up uh, the t-distribution. You can pause the video and examine the formulas, but the main message I want to convey is that, as before, we want to ask about the distribution of possible sample means, or in this case, is, this case difference in means, and to find out what the 95% confidence interval is by identifying the central 95% of that distribution through taking the standard error and multiplying it with the appropriate number. If the sample size is large, that number would be 1.96. But if that sample size is low, uh, below 30, let's say, that number would depend on the shape of the T distribution, which in turn depends on the degrees of freedom. <clears throat> so far, our main goal has been to estimate the magnitude of the difference and how confident we can be in this. But in some cases, you might be most interested in whether the difference is positive or negative, and the magnitude is of secondary interest. Now, if our sample estimate is of the mean of a minus b uh, to be plus 3, then our best guess is that the difference is positive. In other words, a has a larger clutch size, say, than does b. But what degree of confidence do we have in this conclusion that a has a larger clutch size than b? Again, we need a distribution which can be generated in two ways, as we uh, as we have spoken about many times by now uh, through bootstrap or by assuming a normal distribution. Uh, for paired data, the distribution is that of possible mean differences. For unpaired data, the distribution is of possible differences in the means. In both cases, we ask what proportion of possible sample outcomes fall above zero, that is differences are positive, a greater than b, and what proportion of possible sample or means fall below zero that is differences are negative b greater than a we can find this out by counting up what proportion of outcomes are below zero in our bootstrap results so here's a distribution of 10000 bootstrap means of differences by counting up how many of these are less than zero we find that 1626 are negative this means that 16.26% of the means of differences are negative or we can do this from the properties of the normal distribution using a z table. In this example, the mean is 1 and the standard, DV, uh, standard error is 0.7. So the normal distribution corresponding to this would look like this. What fraction of the area under such a normal distribution falls to the left of 0? We use our familiar formula to get the z score and see that 0 is 1.4 standard errors to the left of the mean. So that means now we have to look up a z table. Here is an example of a z table. I know the numbers are small, but there are two columns of numbers. The first is a z value or a series of z values. And the second is the area under the normal distribution to the left of that value. For example, we need to know the area to the left of a z score of minus 1.4. And the table tells us that this area is 0.08 or 8%. In other words, minus 1.40 is at the 0.08 quantile. By contrast, if in the distribution of means the overall mean was below zero, such that the z score was actually uh, plus 1.4, then the table would tell us um, that the area to the left of plus 1.4 is 0.919 or 91.9 percent. So plus 1.40 lies at the 0.919 quantile. So now we know that in this distribution, 0 lies at the 0.08 quantile. In other words, it divides the lower 8% of the distribution from the upper 92% of the distribution. What this means that uh, is that in our distribution of potential sample mean differences, 8% of those means are expected to be negative and 92% of those means are expected to be positive. And this means that although our best guess is that the population mean is plus 1 and therefore the difference between A and B is positive, there's an 8% chance that we are wrong and that the true population mean is actually negative, which, is, which happens when B is actually greater than A. So if we conclude that the difference between A and B is positive, that is the population difference between A and B is positive, we estimate that the chance that this is a wrong conclusion is 8%. Uh, 
uh, if that happens then the error that we would be making is an error in sign where the sign of the difference is actually negative rather than positive. Um, this is known as an error of type S where S stands for sign. In this case the probability of committing type S error is 8%. Because the probability of uh, type S error is small in this example we uh, perhaps are pretty confident in our conclusion that the A is greater than B and the difference between A and B is positive. Now please note a potential confusion. Type S error is an error in the same way as we mean it in everyday language. It denotes a mistake in our conclusion. This is different from the word error in standard error which denotes variation or precision rather than mistake. I'm, I'm sorry that the words are being used with different meanings. If it were up to me, I would rename standard error to avoid this confusion. But we have to uh, get used to the same words being used in, uh, in different meanings. So that was one example. In another example, say the mean difference is 2 and the standard error is 2.5. And hence the sample mean is 0.8 standard errors above 0. What is the area to the left of 0 in this case? Looking up a z table again, we find that a z score of minus 0.8 corresponds to the 0.21 quantile. So the area to the left of minus 0.8 is 21% of the total. And therefore, if we conclude that the mean difference is positive, we run the risk of committing an error of type S with a probability of 0.21. And because that probability is very large, we can't be very confident in our conclusion. We can go one step beyond and ask what is the relative probability that the true population difference is positive versus negative. We can do this by calculating what's known as the odds. The odds is the ratio between the two probabilities involved. For example, 1, the area under the curve above 0 was 92% uh, and the area below 0 was 8%. So the corresponding probabilities are 0.92 and 0.08. The ratio between these two is called the odds and in this case it is 11.5. And we can interpret this to mean that given the data we have, uh, the true population difference between A and B is 11.5 times as likely to be positive as it is to be negative. So there's a lot of evidence towards the, it being positive, that is towards the population uh, difference being positive. For example 2, we get an odds of 3.7 <clears throat> which means that our evidence is only enough to say that the true population difference between A and B is a little over three times as likely to be positive than it is to be negative. So when evaluating whether a difference in means is positive or negative, it's useful to routinely calculate the probability of type S error and also the odds between positive and negative and make your conclusion based on this. By the way, this can also be used when you're estimating a single quantity and want to compare that against some threshold, which we'll see just now. For example, say you want to find out whether the average number of eggs that pairs of Great Indian Busters hatch is greater or less than the number of hatchlings needed to maintain the population at steady state. Now I don't actually know what that number is, but suppose you know that uh, given the mortality rate of Bustards, for the population to be stable, each pair must hatch 1.9 eggs per year. And this would exactly balance uh, birth and death, uh, let's say. So you go to Rajasthan, you study busted breeding and find that the average number of hatchlings in your sample of busted pairs is 3 with a standard error of 1.2. Now remember that if the true population average is above 1.9 hatchlings per pair, the population will increase. But if it's below 1.9, the population will decrease. What can we conclude about what will happen to the population? Our best guess is that the population will increase because 3 is greater than 1.9. But we also know that there is such a thing as type S error. And because the uh, standard error is 1.2 and therefore 1.9 lies 0.91 standard errors to the left of 3, we can look up a Z table and find that a Z score of minus 0.91 corresponds to the 0.18 quantile, which means that the probability of committing type S error is 18%. And the odds between a true population mean of above 1.9 versus below 1.9 is 0.82 divided by 0.18, which is 4.5. And so we say that our best guess is that the true population number of uh, hatchlings per pair is above 1.9. But we're not all that confident about this. We would be much happier if the odds were, say, 20, so that the probability 
that the mean number of hatchlings per pair was above replacement rates was 20 times that of the probability that the number is the, the real number, the true population number is below replacement rate. So our result is somewhat unsatisfactory. To avoid such a vague result in which you don't have much confidence, the one thing you can and must do is to make sure your study has sufficient precision, which if you remember from before, you can achieve through planning the study such that your sample size is large enough. And please always remember that although I'm using the standard normal or Z distribution in these examples, if the sample size is less than 30, it's really the T distribution that should be used. And unlike the, as we've talked about, unlike the Z distribution, the properties of the T distribution depend on sample size or more accurate, accurately the degrees of freedom, which in this case would be the number of uh, pairs minus one. We subtract one from the sample size because we have taken up one degree of freedom in estimating the mean of the population uh, in the number of hatchlings. Let's now move on to our final task, which is to assess the association between two numeric variables. We can do this if each entity that we sample has at least two variables measured. For example, we may have a number of plots within which we have measured canopy cover as well as number of bird species. Or we may have a number of individual birds, say magpie robins, for which we have measured both body size as well as territory size. We want to know whether there is an association between canopy cover and number of bird species or between body size and territory size. In each case, what relationship exists between the two variables? We usually shouldn't and in fact cannot infer anything about cause and effect without a lot of uh, further work. So when I say association or relationships, uh, relationship or correlation, it's just describing the pattern and not implying anything about cause. Now visualizing these relationships is straightforward. We can uh, draw scatter plots by spreading out one variable on the x-axis and the other on the y-axis and putting a circle or cross or other symbol representing each sampling unit in our data. And just like in the earlier part of this video, we'd like to summarize this visual pattern in some way. For single variables, for example, uh, we were interested in central tendency and we could use the mean or median. Uh, but for relationships between two variables, we are interested in, in a measure of association. And the simplest measure of association is called the correlation coefficient. So we first identify the means of x and y, indicated here by the vertical and horizontal lines. Then for each point on the graph, we take the deviation from the mean and then multiply the deviation uh, in x with the deviation in y and sum up all of these. You may uh, see that if there's no relationship between X and Y, then positive deviations in X will be associated sometimes with positive deviations in Y and sometimes with negative deviations in Y. And the overall sum will therefore be near zero. By contrast, if there's an increasing relationship between Y and X, as shown here, then positive deviations in X will be associated with positive deviations in Y and negative deviations in X will be associated with negative deviations in Y. In both cases, because we're multiplying them, we will get large positive numbers. On the other hand, we don't have many examples of the converse situation, where positive deviations in X are associated with negative deviations in Y and vice versa. So the overall sum of all these products will be a positive number. And if there's a decreasing relationship between Y and X, then positive deviations in one variable will tend to be associated with negative deviations in the other and the overall sum will be negative. We also need to divide by the degrees of freedom so that we get the average of these joint deviations and we also divide by the product of the standard deviations of x and y in order to scale the correlation coefficient within specific bounds. So what can we tell from the correlation coefficient? We can say something about the direction of the association, whether it's positive, negative, or no association. And we can say something about the strength of the association, whether it's a tight association or loose. Remember, remember as always, we are deriving uh, the data and the scatter plot and the correlation coefficient by sampling from an underlying larger population. And we hope that the correlation we get in our sample is uh, similar to close to the population correlation coefficient. So we denote the sample correlation coefficient by a Latin letter, in this case R, 
and the true population correlation coefficient by the Greek letter rho, which I've not shown here. Now, the correlation coefficient is fine for an initial look. Uh, it um, varies between minus 1 and plus 1. Uh, the sign of the correlation coefficient tells you the direction of the relationship. And uh, the farther away from 0 uh, the correlation coefficient is, the tighter the relationship. But the correlation coefficient has some limitations. Firstly, it measures only the linear or straight line relationship between the two variables. If the relationship is anything other than a straight line, the correlation coefficient is inadequate and in fact can be quite misleading. You can see this uh, from two examples. Uh, the points on the left are very tightly arranged and we might expect them to have a correlation coefficient of close to 0.99 but since the relationship is not a straight line, the value is lower. The example on the right is more extreme. Here, y increases as x up to a point and then decreases. But despite the very clear pattern, the correlation coefficient is near zero, which is of course because the correlation coefficient breaks down in situations like this. Second, consider these two relationships. Both have the same correlation coefficient but in one case, y increases rapidly as x increases and in the other case, y barely increases at all as x increases. We often want to understand the magnitude of change of y with x. For example, do bird species increase greatly as forest patch size increases or only by a little? Or do larger magpie robins have much bigger territories than small magpie robins? Or are their territories only slightly bigger? To assess this, we need to draw a line describing the relationship between y and x and examine the properties of that line. The simplest line, uh, of course, that we can draw to describe the relationship between two variables is a straight line. I've said earlier that it may not, in fact, be a straight line at all in, the, in, in, in real life, in the data that we have. But let's start with uh, the simplest possible situation. You may have learnt in mathematics that the equation of a line is y uh, is equal to mx plus c, where y and x are the two variables, m is the slope, and c is the intercept. In statistics, we use a slightly different formulation, playing, placing the intercept before the slope and renaming. So we say y is equal to a plus bx. Here a is the intercept and b is the slope. Now as you know, the intercept is the value of y when x is 0. You can substitute 0 for x in the equation and see that this is true. And b is the slope, which is the rate at which y increases for a unit increase in x. Let's see if this is correct. We set a is equal to uh, 0.5 and b is equal to 2. For x is 1, y is then 2.5. And if we increase x by 1 unit from 1 to 2, y then becomes 4.5, which is 2 units more than earlier. And that is the slope. So it works. Of course, neither a uh, uh, nor b is restricted to be a positive number. If a is negative, it means that when y is 0, y is negative. And if b is negative, it means that as x increases, y decreases. And as before, please don't let this kind of language lead you to believe we are only talking about causal relationships between x and y. For these purposes here, we are agnostic about cause and effect. We don't require that. We are only looking at the association. So now that we are familiar with the equation of a straight line, the question is, what equation best describes the relationship between y and x? <clears throat> there are an infinite number of lines that can be drawn. Which one should we choose? The answer is that we need to define some criterion. Evaluate all possible lines according to this criterion and then choose the one that fits best. So what criterion should we follow? Now, I'm sure you can think of multiple possible criteria that could be used. But uh, for now, let's imagine that our main purpose is to predict y values from x. In other words, we want to draw a line such that if we know the, say, the body size of a magpie robin, we're able to come up with the best prediction for the size of its territory. And that prediction is the point on the line corresponding to that particular x value. We won't be able to predict perfectly, of course, because the actual y will usually be some distance from the predicted y, perhaps larger, perhaps smaller than predicted. We can call this the deviation or error in the prediction. 
If the observed y is greater than predicted, we get a positive deviation or error. If it's less than predicted, we get a negative deviation or error. Now, whenever we predict, we want to do that with the greatest overall accuracy. So one possible criterion we can think of is to find the line that minimizes the sum of all deviations or error. This makes sense, but we run up against a familiar problem, which is that the sum of the positive deviations might balance out the sum of the negative deviations, and this won't do. So we apply a familiar solution to this problem, which is to square all the deviations so that all become positive and their sum will always be zero or greater. Now our task is to find the line that minimizes the sum of squared deviations, also called SSD, or, or the sum of squared errors, which we can call SSE, but both mean the same thing. Now you can try out various combinations of intercept and slope, say a million combinations, and uh, for each of them calculate the SSE, and then find that uh, intercept and slope uh, which results in the smallest SSE. This is called a brute force approach and as you can imagine it requires considerable computational power. Luckily for a simple problem such as finding the equation of a line that minimizes SSE, there is an analytical solution meaning we can directly calculate the answer rather than, rather than having to explore lots of possibilities using a computer. I won't show you how to calculate the solution because you can easily look it up but the point is that what we, uh, what we have now is called the regression line, which is the line that minimizes the sum of squared error and therefore is also called the least squares line. More generally, the procedure we have just followed is called regression, a term that you may have heard before. And so from now on, we'll call this assessment of the association between two variables x and y as regression analysis. Let's remind ourselves of some uh, notation and also bring up some terminology so that we can use it later. Although we don't assume cause and effect, typically we put a possible causal variable on the x-axis and the outcome variable on the y-axis. Uh, other terms used are uh, independent or predictor variable for the x variable and dependent or response variable for the y variable. Some of these words have a very causal connotation but again uh, resist falling into that trap the main thing is that we are trying to predict y from x uh, whether or not the relationship between them is causal. Now we can write an equation relating y to x. We use y hat to denote uh, predicted values of y. y hat is described by the equation of a line and is equal to a plus bx where a and b um, that is the intercept and slope are estimated through the regression analysis. But of course the individual y values deviate to some degree from the predicted line so we can say that the individual y values uh, are the predicted values plus some error. And of course because the individual values, the predictions and the errors are different for each value of x, we can make this explicit by putting the subscript i uh, for y, y hat, x and e. The intercept and slope are not subscripted because they apply to the entire relationship. Um, in other words, if y and x are variables, a and b are called constants. Now, as we have discussed several times already, just as the sample mean is an estimate of the true population mean, here the sample intercept and slope are estimates of the true population intercept and slope. Let me depict this visually. Say this scatter describes the entire population and the entire population shows a mild positive relationship between y and x with a fair bit of scatter. Overlaid onto this is the true population regression, calculated as if we were all knowing. But of course we are not all knowing. So from this population we sample 30 entities at random and add the, uh, do the regression analysis and find the regression line now in blue. Notice that the uh, intercept and slope of the sample regression are not the same as that of the population regression. If we sampled a different 30 entities from the population at random, then we'd get another pair of values for intercept and slope, again different from the population regression. And so it is with another sample of 30. So this all is just to reiterate that the sample estimates may be our best guess for the population parameters, but they could be a close guess or they could be a poor guess. <clears throat> and this depends on the precision of our study, which in turn depends on the variability in the population uh, and our sample size. To illustrate this, 
above we have a population relationship with high variability we can also call it high scatter and below is an example of low variability or low scatter you can imagine that in the first case each set of samples can result in quite different regression lines shown in blue but in the second case the regression lines for different sets of samples are unlikely to be all that different from each other so just as before we want to understand the precision of our estimates and in particular we typically focus on the precision of the slope because that is the quantity of interest in most cases whereas the intercept is rarely of much significance in our analysis now just as before we want something like a 95% confidence interval for the sample slope such that we have an idea about the range within which the true population slope is likely to be again just as earlier we have two broad ways of arriving at such a confidence interval we can make minimal assumptions and use a bootstrap method in this case we can resample the entities we have measured with replacement each time generating a data set of the same sample size as the original and each time we calculate and store the intercept and slope of the regression line we then find the 2.5th percentile and 97.5th percentile and that interval is a 95% confidence interval because it contains 95% of the possible sample slopes or we can use the other method which assumes that the sample slopes uh, follow a normal distribution or a t distribution of course at low sample sizes then as before we need to find the st um, standard error of the slope and multiply the standard error with some number which is 1.96 when the sample size is greater than 30 and uh, and then and we can assume that distribution of sample size slopes is normal or that multiplier is something else not 1.96 um, if the sample size is less than 30 and we need to use the t distribution instead now the standard error of a regression slope isn't quite as easy to calculate as the standard error of the mean of a single variable and so i won't show it here suffice it to say for now that the software you use will give you the slope of the regression line as well as well as its standard error once you have that we find the appropriate number to multiply with the slope to give the 95 percent confidence interval around the slope and just remember if you use the t distribution you have to calculate the degrees of freedom as sample size minus two because you have lost one degree of freedom in estimating the intercept and a second degree of freedom in estimating the slope so now you have the confidence interval and you can also uh, go ahead and find out the probability of type s error that is the probability that the true slope is in fact of the opposite sign than your best guess and you can calculate the odds of the true slope being of the sign of your best guess rather than that a sign of the opposite uh, the opposite sign now when visualizing a regression you can imagine that you plot the response variable on the y-axis and the predictor on the x as discussed earlier this is called a scatter plot on top of the scatter plot you would overlay the regression line and then in order to depict the uncertainty in the regression line it's common to show the 95 percent confidence interval in the intercept and slope which appears as the in the dark gray region over here this gives a visual idea of the range of possibilities for what the true population regression might look like so always be sure to plot the confidence interval and not only the regression line now one additional measure that you will often see accompanying regression results is something called r square it's important that you know what it is so let's find out the variability in y the quantity that we're trying to predict can be described by different quantities of what are called sums of squares before you carry out any regression analysis your best guess for the y value uh, of any particular entity is simply the mean of y so the sum of the square deviations of all the y's from their mean is called the total sum of squares now once we have carried out the regression our best guess for the y value of a particular entity is the predicted y from the regression line by how much do these predicted values differ from the mean if we sum the squared difference between the predicted values and the mean of y we call that the regression or explained sum of squares finally even after carrying out the regression the predictions are not perfect and the individual y values deviate from the predictions to some degree the deviations from predicted are also called residuals or errors and the sum of the squared residuals is called the residual sum of squares or the error sum of squares 
Now the interesting thing is that the total sum of squares is equal to the regression sum of squares plus the error sum of squares. From this it follows that the larger the regression sum of squares, the smaller the error sum of squares. And if the error sum of squares is small, it means that the points are close to the regression line. In this situation, the predictions are more accurate and the line fits the data better. So if we were able to calculate the fraction residual sum of squares divided by total sum of squares, then the higher that number, the better the fit of the regression line. In practice, this is most easily calculated using the error sum of squares. So if you divide the entire equation by the total sum of squares on both sides and rearrange the terms, you'll see that the quantity we want is equal to one minus the error sum of squares divided by the total sum of squares. This quantity is called the coefficient of determination or R square. R square can range only from zero to one. Now, if there were absolutely no relationship between y and x, then the slope of the regression line would be zero and the intercept would be the mean of y. So the regression sum of squares would be zero and the error sum of squares would be the same as the total sum of squares, making the R square zero. At the other extreme, if all values of y fall exactly on the regression line, then the error sum of squares would be zero and the R square would be one. So this property means that the R square can be interpreted as the proportion of variation in x, uh, sorry, as the proportion of variation in y explained by x. Recall that the slope doesn't tell you this. You can have two data sets with the same slope, but with different scatter. So the slope and the R square together tell you about both the average rate of change of y with x as well as the proportion of variation in y explained by x. And as a small aside, it turns out that the r square is actually just the square of our old friend, the correlation coefficient. So everything is related to one another. It's now time to, uh, to examine some of the key assumptions of uh, regression analysis. The first and most important assumption is that of validity that what you are measuring is meaningful to your research question. If you are interested in body size, is the best measure wing length or leg length or body mass or some combination of the three? Does the total number of species really measure the aspect that you are interested in, which is conservation value of a patch of habitat? If your measurement does not correspond relatively closely to what you care about in your research, then no amount of fancy statistics can help. For further assumptions of regression, we need to look at the regression equation and divide it into two parts. What is called the deterministic or fixed part of the equation and what is called the stochastic or random part of the equation. The deterministic part specifies how exactly we expect y to be related to x and the stochastic part tells us about the error or deviations or residuals, all these three referring to the same thing. So the next most important assumption is about the deterministic part of the equation. The assumption is that y is indeed related to x in the manner specified. In a simple regression, the relationship is a straight line. So the assumption is that y is linearly related to x. This may seem reasonable to you, but consider that many variables of interest cannot go below zero, including number of species, population size, time spent on a particular activity and so on. On the other hand, on the other side, some measures can't, can't go above one or hundred, like probabilities or percent of area under forest or proportion of time spent uh, foraging. And in other cases, we may expect a curved or a saturating relationship, like between the area of a forest and the number of species it hosts. This is likely to grow to a point and then stop. A more extreme example is when the slope of the relationship changes sign. For example, in the relationship between number of species and habitat disturbance, we often see the most species in places that have intermediate levels of disturbance. In all these cases, simple linear regression will be at worst, at best misleading, and at worst, it will be utterly wrong. Now, there are ways to identify and deal with all these sorts of situations, but for now, I want to encourage you to not simply assume that the relationship between y and x is linear, but rather think about it carefully first and also make sure you plot the data to check for deviations from linearity. Lastly, we have some assumptions about the stochastic part of the regression equation. The assumptions are that the uh, error or residuals are independent of one another and are drawn from a normal distribution with constant variance. 
These assumptions are particularly important when we want to use the shortcut method to calculate standard error and confidence intervals from the properties of the normal distribution or t-distribution. But the assumptions about the stochastic uh, part of the equation are less important if we use the bootstrap method to find the precision of our estimate. Now, there are many more aspects of regression that I would leave you to explore, including how to detect points that lie outside the main cloud of points and therefore have a disproportionate effect on the results and what to do them uh, if anything should be done. I also leave you to explore more uh, complicated regression models with more than one predictor variable, including predictors that are categorical and not only numeric. But even while exploring these more complicated versions, keep in mind that uh, most of the fundamental aspects discussed here remain the same. Remember that we are sampling from a population and that our goal is to come up uh, with some conclusion about the population parameter. And of course, that conclusion is meant to provide information needed to answer the research question we started with. Now, having discussed visualization and analysis of single quantities, comparisons, as well as associations between two variables, you may be wondering how one actually implements all these ways of visualizing and analyzing data. If you are uh, serious about research and data analysis, the one main piece of advice I would give you is to move away from using spreadsheet programs like Excel and learn a statistical and programming language like R. All the graphs and analysis I've shown you in this video were done in R. It's one of the most powerful tools you can learn for all manner of graphics and analysis. And because it's not just a software for statistics and graphics, but also a programming language, it's very flexible and you can implement just about any analysis that you want using R. There are many online resources through which you can learn R. Uh, and I would say once you have a basic understanding of R, I'd suggest you find and work through the free online book called R for Data Science. And if you manage to work through to the end of that book, you will be very well placed to tackle any kind of graphical or analytical challenge that you may encounter in your research. And finally, going back to where we started this uh, video, I wanted to say that uh, although each of the different aspects of the research cycle we have spoken about are often treated separately with, for example, separate books on research design and separate books on statistical analysis, in reality, the different boxes here should not be thought of as independent of one another. Ideally, you would view all the steps as a whole and plan and design your study having thought about each step. For example, after framing your objective, it's best to think about the tasks needed to be carried out to meet the objective. Then think about the design of the research for each. Imagine what kind of data you might collect, how you might visualize, analyze and interpret it, and then assess whether that will meet the objective. Plan out different combinations of tasks, different research designs and analyses, so you can compare them and choose which best meets your overall need. Often you might work backward, uh, deciding that a particular kind of graph or comparison is what is needed to meet your objective. And from that starting point, you might design your study. So to summarize, before you actually embark on your study, it's useful to scribble out the entire process in a notebook, sketching out various possibilities, and then deciding which to follow, making sure that you follow good practices in each of these steps and that the logic has no flaws that you can see. In fact, it's a good idea to explain your plan to several friends and colleagues and ask them to pick holes in it, ask them to find problems in it. Better to identify opportunities and even deficiencies before you embark on your study rather than have them pointed out to you after you have spent six months or three years on your work. So this brings us to the end of a rather long lecture. If you are already familiar with many of these concepts, I hope this has been a useful refresher. If much of what I have said is new, don't expect it all to sink in immediately. You may have to watch this video multiple times, pausing here and there and sketching things out with pen and paper or crunching numbers on a computer. Understanding data and dealing with it to extract the kinds of meaning we're looking for is not a simple task, nor does it come instinctively to most of us. Um, but for much of our research in which uh, quantitative analysis is a key element, it's worth trying to develop a sort of an intuition about numbers, about basic mathematics, statistical inferences, and data visualization. This will not come immediately or easily, but rather through a combination of reading and learning as well as experience in handling data. And in the meantime, please try to resist the temptation of viewing data analysis as a recipe that can be followed from a textbook of statistics 
Instead, instead, while you carry out your analysis, try to understand every step of what you're doing well enough to feel it in your bones, so to speak. Now, this is easier said than done, I know, but I hope that this lecture helps start you off on this journey.